David uh, Livingston was a pillar of influence in 19th century Britain, and he was known for a lot of different things. He was known for his scientific research. He was known in his stance against slavery, and he was known as his works as a minister. The story goes that there was a society, a a missionary society, I had a missionary society in Britain that wanted to send some men to help David in his work in Africa. And so they contacted him and they said, if you have found good roads to get to where you are, we have some men who are ready to come and assist you. His response was, if your men are only willing to come, if there are good roads, don't send them. I want men who will come if there are no roads. I like that. One thing that all of us find attractive or appealing, desirable in one another is loyalty or commitment. You think of all the ways we see that today. Some are loyal to brands, and so they buy the same brand every time. Their sneakers are always the same kind of sneakers. Their cars are always the same kind of car. There are some of you, I don't know the right term, hairdresser, haircutter. You have found the person who does your hair really well, and if they move to a different location, even if it's across the Metroplex, you'll drive to them out of loyalty. Some businesses try and get your loyalty. They have those little punch cards. Remember, if you come just so often, We're going to incentivize you coming back again and again because loyalty is something we desire. Now think about the deeper level of loyalty, the deeper meaning when we attach it to a relationship. In a marriage, we're talking about the commitment of one's heart and life and promise and love and service until until death do us part. With children, there's an unspoken loyalty between mom and dads and kids. And it's put to the test usually about three o'clock in the morning when they cry out, mom and dad, and they come running in because they know they can trust mom and dad in the moments they need them the most. One of the painful realities of my generation, of the millennials, is that we have a commitment issue. And so relationships don't last long because they just failed to commit. We're looking this morning at our annual theme for the year. I hope singing it today has been Just fond for each one of us as we're thinking through the beautiful words of this good song, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing, loyalty and commitment are the heart of today's phrase. Today's phrase is, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. A fetter, like chains or like shackles. It's calling for the Lord to bind, to commit our hearts to him completely. So we're going to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, Jesus has a massive crowd that has come to him. They're looking to the master, the master who teaches in incredible ways. And Jesus, in the midst of this occasion with this large crowd, out of compassion, feeds a number of people that was over 5,000. What uh, we come out of this miracle, down in verse 14, what was the result is that therefore it says when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Oh, they were amazed, amazed at the miracle, amazed at what Jesus had done. And so they want to make him king. They didn't understand the kingdom. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't understand why he came. And so he withdrew. The apostles go across the sea, and Jesus meets them there on the water. Just think back to Jansen's wonderful lesson about Jesus on the sea with his disciples. Well, they cross the sea, and the people notice that Jesus has gone across the sea, and so they follow him there. But it's obvious they're not there because they're attracted to the Messiah. They're not attracted to his message. They're not even really attracted to the miraculous, to the miracle. They just want more food. They want the meal. And so down in chapter uh, 6, down in verse 12, At 26, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. They just were hungry. They wanted more food. And so Jesus takes advantage of the opportunity and he teaches, He instructs the people not to desire the things that perish. Don't pursue things in your life that are so futile and so empty. He calls for the people to desire and to pursue the things that last. The things that are eternal, the things that are spiritual. In verse 27, he says, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Pursue the greater, more spiritual, more lasting things. And so he talks to them about what God provided. Oh, they make it really clear. There was a time in the past when God provided food for them, manna in the wilderness, And Jesus says, there's a greater bread that God has provided that if you eat, you will never hunger again. It will bring life. 
And their response to him in verse 34, they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And his response in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And they didn't get it, but Jesus wasn't done. It continued on to make things far more significant, far more demanding. When he says that hunger and that thirst you have for physical bread and for drink, that ought to be the same desire you have for me. Because he says down in verse 53, this, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in yourselves. I want you to totally and completely consume me. Nope, not cannibalism. No, not the Lord's Supper. I want you to take in everything that I am, every word, every example. I want me to be your everlasting, your total desire and focus. Now, here's the thing. The chapter began with people pursuing Jesus, following Jesus, wanting to make Jesus their king. And in verse 66 of our context, it says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. It's a short turnaround, isn't it? That phrase in our hymn, my wandering heart, bind my wandering heart, it's, it's a reminder that there are some today, just like in the context of John 6, who may start with Jesus and find some things attractive about Jesus, but along the way wander from him, leave him altogether. And the reasons can be really different. There are some who wander because of difficult truth. That's right here. They couldn't understand what it was that, that Jesus was saying. In verse 60, it says, many of his disciples, when they said it, said this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And there are some hard things about God, understanding about God. How is he three in one? How is God invisible and yet exists? There's some difficult things even in the Bible to try and understand about what is to come in eternal life and the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. Peter even said that, that Paul's writings are difficult to understand. And there are some who, because they wrestle with some of the things that are difficult to comprehend, the questions we don't have answers to, they just give up altogether. If I can't figure it out, if I can't understand it, then no one can, and that's the reason they walk away from the Lord. For some, it's demanding expectations. That's literally what Jesus does here. If you're going to come after me, you have to be willing to be all in. All in with me. Eat my flesh and my blood. And my blood. You have to be all in with me. That's what he said far before this in Luke 9 when he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Right? If you want to be my disciple, you can't be on the fence. Right? I'll give you some of my time. I'll give you some of my money. I'll give you some of my attention. You know the greatest command that Jesus gave? That was really neat. Love the Lord your God with some of your heart and a portion of your mind and some of your strength. So I want your all, all. I want your all completely in with Jesus. And there are some when they realize that if that's really what it means to follow Jesus, if it's all or nothing, if it was some, I'd be in, kind of like I have a Netflix and I have a Disney Plus and I have a Hulu. If I could have some of Jesus and choose what I want, I will. But if it's all or nothing, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm there to give Jesus all that I have. It's too demanding. For some, it's discord with brethren. For some, it's God's people. Oh, I love God, and I love Jesus, and I love my relationship with him, but God's people. It's the attitudes that rub. It's the conflict that comes. The judgment that's given, it's the literal application of what Paul said, that if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed with one another. And there's a lot of people who leave the Lord, not because of the Lord, but because of his people. I'm, I'm just tired. I'm tired of your people being hypocritical. I'm tired of being judged. I'm tired of the fighting. I'm tired, tired of the arguing. And that's the reason that some turn away. For some, it's just discouragement from hardships. I, the loss of job. Stretched too thin at the end of the month, and I just don't have enough money coming in. And I'm, and I'm stressed. It's the illness. It's the sickness. It's the disease. It's the wreck. It's, 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 
costs and on and on it piles. And for some, I would imagine it's disillusionment with God. And we think joining with God, when we talk about God, we usually don't sing songs like Troublesome Times Are Here. We have that in our books. Usually we sing about how amazing God is and how loving God is and how wonderful our life with God is. And it is. But that's not the whole story. There there are some, and brethren, let's be really careful here. This is a reminder for us. There are general truths that are given in in Scripture that are not absolute truths. And sometimes we paint general truths as absolute truths. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. It's a general truth about the provision and the care of God. Does that mean righteous people never go hungry? No. No. Even today there are some wondering where their meal will come from. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. In general, is that true? Absolutely. That if you train up a child, however you want to apply the passage, but certainly if you look at it through a spiritual lens, if you train up a child with a godly example and godly teaching, in general, you would expect that child to follow that path. Is that absolutely true? No. All we have to say is what happened with David? What happened with Solomon? And many of us have tasted that bitter truth as well. You know what is it in absolute truth? I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. That's not a general truth. That's an absolute. We're not going to make it from here to home without facing the hardships of the world. But he ends by saying, take heart, I have overcome the world. Here's the point. I read this this week, and I think it's a good way of summarizing these thoughts. In our modern world, our real danger comes not from irreligion, but mild religion. I'll follow Jesus when it's convenient, when it's good, when life is good for me, when it fits with my schedule and my priorities. I I have a real growing interest in Jesus. I'm very interested in him. There's a difference, one author says, between interest and commitment. When you're interested in doing something, you'll do it only when circumstances permit. When you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. I am interested in Bluebell ice cream. It's not committed yet. It's just interested. I am interested in the Texas Rangers. I'm not interested in the Cowboys. I'm interested in learning new hobbies, new instruments. I am committed to Holly Shouse. Fully and completely. I can't answer it for you, but you can answer it for yourself today. If I have to look at what is suggested before us, am I interested in Jesus? Or am I committed? Jesus on a list of things that I'm curious about, I want to learn more about, or am I all in? Jesus sees his disciples who leave him, and he turns to his 12, and he says, are you going to leave too? They left me. Are you going to leave too? Peter's response is, to whom will we go? To whom will we go? Which means even if life gets hard and even if there's disagreements and disappointments, even when life gets dark, I'm not leaving you. And he gives two reasons why. One, because of who he is. He says down in verse 69 that we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We have come to know it for sure and we cannot betray this truth. You are him. You are the Son of God. We know it because there are some things Jesus claimed no one else could truly claim it. Even here in this context, there's things he claimed. They said down in verse 14, he is a prophet. They wanted in verse 15 to make him a king, and yet his claim is, no, I'm I'm not a prophet, and I'm not your pawn. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life in verse 48. I am the bread of life in verse 35. I'm the bread of life, and he who comes to me will not hunger, and who believes in me will never thirst. I am your source for what it is you need most in this world. 
But it's not just that he claimed it. He made claims no one else could make, but he did things no one else could do. I could claim today to be Superman. I am. You didn't know it, but this whole time I'm, I've been Superman. Now, you said that's, that's a big claim. Well, what if I ripped off the suit and underneath were those blue tights and had a big S on the chest and the red cape? He said, there's going to be a lot of kids like you who's going to have that next week, okay? There's a lot of people who have the costume, okay? Or I've said, okay, okay, but I can beat Tucker Bond in an arm wrestling contest. I can say, his sister can do that too. That's not, that's not the, the test. I'm just, I lost a lot of points there. All right, now, but what if I took off? flew around the room and there's no strings attached. I lit this microphone on fire with the lasers from my eye. I lifted up that pew with a finger. What if I did what only Superman could do? Because Jesus could say, I am the bread of life. I am the word. I am the light. He could claim to be the son of God, but to really own up to that claim, he would have to do what only the Son of God can do. Right here, don't you see it? We, we don't have to go through the Gospels. This chapter opens, and he's feeding 5,000 people with food he multiplied on his own. And then he gets across the Sea of Galilee by walking on the water. And for us today, we ate it and we drank it. There's not a greater demonstration of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God than the fact that he rose from the grave, from the resurrection. So here's the thing. When you look through the New Testament and the Spirit revealed the hearts and the minds of those who heard the claims of Jesus and saw what he could do, this is what they said. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And John 20, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And John 1, 29, John the baptizer sees him coming and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Matthew 27, the centurion who watched everything that took place by the cross, it says that when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Even Martha was the one who says, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming in the world. They heard the claims of Jesus. They saw the miracles of Jesus. But here's the real question. It's not what did they think and what did they believe. That's compelling. Here's what's demanding. Who do you say that he is? Who do I say that he is? And to our Kelly's point today, our brother Kelly, it's not just that he is a Lord, he's my Lord. It's not just that he is a creator, he is my creator. It's not just that he is the redeemer, he is my redeemer. It's not just that he is all in all. He is my all in all. I I cannot leave him knowing what I know about who he is. But then Peter also says that he cannot leave Jesus because of what he has. In verse 68, you have the words of eternal life. In other words, I have found something in you. I have found something in Jesus I cannot find anywhere else. Only in you do I find what I most desperately need in this life. Only in you is their life. Only in you is what it is I have so desperately been looking for. I love how John put this. Notice all here, wrapped in this one passage here, the beginning of Revelation. He says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so. Amen. Do you see what we have only in Jesus? That I have forgiveness over everything I've done, every thought, every word, everything I've gazed upon, everything that I've done in Jesus, I have that forgiveness, complete and total forgiveness. In Jesus, I have purpose that I'm a kingdom, I'm part of a kingdom, and I'm priest, which means every one of us, not one of us here is greater than another, and no one is lesser than another. Every one of us has something to contribute to God's amazing plan. 
Every one of us has service or render. Every one of us has worship to give. Every one of us are part of something a lot larger than ourselves. And ultimately, he points to the fact, I love that we had it right there at the end of the hope. He's coming again, which means I know things are bad. I know they're bad in Israel right now. I know they're bad in the Ukraine. I know they're bad in a lot of places, but it's not the end of the story. We know that the day is going to dawn. We know it's only going to be a matter of time. That was the pause a minute ago, because wouldn't it be great if that sound we heard coming behind me wasn't whatever it was? But the trumpets of the Lord. Can you imagine a greater interruption to a worship service than the Lord himself coming? And we're going to finish. It's not here. Let's take this worship and we'll continue it back at home. That's hope. You know what this looks like? Peter who's saying, only in you have I found this. You, you have the words of eternal life. Do you remember the scene when Jesus is on the way to heal a man's daughter? The synagogue official has a daughter who is dying and so he's on the way and he goes to go and heal her. But then there's this massive crowd that presses in on him And in the midst of that crowd, there's a woman. And all we know about this woman is that she's been sick for a long time. She has this disease, this blood disease. But here's the commentary that Dr. Luke gives us. There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Notice, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Have you had that commentary around about your life? I've tried everything. I've tried it. I went from relationship to relationship to relationship. I jumped from job to job to job. I got the house I always wanted, the career I've always dreamed of, and yet nothing, nothing's giving me what it is I want most desperately, what I need. She spent all her life looking for healing, and she never found it. But in reaching to Jesus, touching the friends of his garment, immediately, what could not be done in 12 years through all the power and the wisdom of man is accomplished by a simple touch in the cloak of the Savior. Maybe her story is a lot like my story. I've been chasing a lot. I've been chasing through jobs and through work and through relationships. I'm trying to find meaning and forgiveness and fulfillment and purpose And I'm always coming up empty and maybe it's time for me to stop looking to the world and looking to myself and looking to my relationships and making my mate try to be my savior and realize the only source of eternal life, the only source of the words of life, the only source of what it is I need most in this life and most right now is him. He's the son of God. So can you hear the question today that Jesus is asking? The same question he asked of his apostles. Will you leave me too? Will you leave me? There's a lot who left. There's a lot who started the journey and they didn't finish it. Are you going to leave too? Can you give the answer of Peter today? Can we do that? That even in disagreements with one another and it gets tense, or discouragement. He don't thinks it real dark. Lord, where where would I go? To, to whom would I go? No matter how bad it gets, Lord, you are the one who has the words of life. How do we walk this off the page? One, commitment is made with words. It is the giving of our word, a promise, a pledge, a guarantee. In marriage, it sounds like this. I do. And I will continue to do until death do us part. With Christ, it sounds like this. I will. I will serve. I will follow. I will yield. Not my will, your will be done. It's made with words, but that's not where it ends, good brethren, because a marriage is not built merely on words. It's followed through with commitment. Commitment is kept with actions, with deeds. It's keeping our word. It's following through on our promises. It's continuing what it was that we pledged. I have promised, I have given, I will follow through. Now, look at that on the screen. Commitment is made with words. It's kept with actions. Look at what Paul says. 
according to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ shall even know now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Do you hear the pledge of words? If I live, if I die, my aim is that Christ will be glorified in me. Now I can make that commitment with my lips, but can I keep that in how I live? Because I can make it right now as I'm feeling really healthy. But then if I have to leave from here and I have to go to the cancer doctor, if I have to go to the hospital, if things seem imminent, will I make that same claim and follow through with that same attitude, that same disposition? Commitment's not just made with words, it's kept. It's kept with a life of action. I'm pledging my life, but I'm following through by following you. Now, in your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. There's a statement that is given in Psalm 31 and verse 5. Into your hand, notice, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. It's a rich verse. But you notice that statement, into your hands I commit. I mean, the pledge, the promise, the statement with the expectation that someone's going to follow through with what they do. Luke 23 and verse 46, And Jesus crying out with a loud voice says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's our pledge. There's our words. There's a promise. What to say next? Having said this, he breathed his last. He finished the plan. He fulfilled the mission. He let go and stepped into death, trusting his father would care for him the rest of the way. What would your story say with this? And Jordan said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And thus he How would your story read if this were said of us? In your song books, I want you to open to a song we sang this morning, song number 564. It's a beautiful song we've not sung in, in a long time. Together we're going to sing verse 2. We're going to keep on our heart the very things we've been talking about this morning. Into your hand, I commit, I commit, I pledge, I promise, I give, I devote my spirit to you. Aaron?
and to your hand I commit my spirit. Hand in hand will follow the Savior. Can you say that today? Let your goodness, like a fetter, bind, completely commit this wandering heart to you. Will you commit your life to Jesus today? Will you walk hand in hand with him? If we can help you this hour, this very minute, let's come for right now, right here in the front as we sing and as we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.